And uh, today our scripture reading is coming from Luke 3 and 7. Now I want you to engage. I want you to lock in. I know we get antsy if you're watching online. It's easy to be distracted. But let's just take some time just to lock in and focus on the things of God. Now, look, we're, we're reading a, 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 a pretty, you know, we're, we're reading a sizable portion of Scripture today because I know you can handle it. Amen. And, and some of us ain't, ain't read all week. So this is, this is our makeup session. I'm going to help you with your Bible readings on this week. We're going to make it all up on today. Amen. So let's just stay engaged. Um, we're reading from Luke 3. I'm starting at verse 7. We're picking up from our brother John. Brian, John, last week we talked about how John was preaching repentance. John was the forerunner. John was preparing the way for Jesus. We're picking up on part two of John's sermon to the people. And let me tell you, John is not out here playing any games. John don't have no time for, for games for the people, all right? So let's pick it up. Verse 7, it says, Then John, he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, Brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Oh, my, John, John came with it. Verse 8, Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, well, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children to Abraham from these stones. So don't be thinking you out here special. That, I added that. Okay. Uh, verse 9. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the tree. Therefore, every tree which does not bear fruit, good fruit, is cut down and thrown into the fire. Verse 11, I mean, verse 10. So the people asked him, saying, what shall we do then? He answered and said to them, he who has two tunics, let him give to him who has none. He who has food, let him do likewise. Then the tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what should we do? And he said to them, collect no more than what is appointed for you. Likewise, the soldiers asked him, saying, and what shall we do? Wouldn't y'all want some police to come and have a revival of police and soldiers who will say this in Jesus' name? All right, they said, what shall we do? And he said, so he said to them, do not intimidate anyone or accuse falsely. And be content with your wages. My God, it's a word for today. Okay. In verse 15. Now as the people were in expectation. Someone say expectation. Now as the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming. Someone say coming. Whose sandal strap I am not worthy to lose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Hallelujah. His winnowing hand, his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. And with the many other exhortations he preached to the people. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, the hearers, the doers of God's holy word. Amen. Amen. So our sermon title today, we're just going to spend a little time talking on the subject, Who Are You Expecting? Who Are You Expecting? Come on, put it in the chat. Say, who are you expecting? If you're sitting by somebody, ask them, neighbor, who are you expecting? If you're all by yourself, touch yourself on, the, on your chest, pat yourself on the chest and say, self, who am I expecting? It kind of reminds me of, I don't know if you grew up in a household like me, but if, uh, if anyone came to my house unexpectedly, like, it wasn't like, oh, I wonder who that is. Like, oh, my gosh, someone's ringing the doorbell. Let's see who it is. No, no, no. We had a different, 
attitude when it came to unexpected visitors at our house. Someone rang the doorbell and we didn't know who they was. It was an instant attitude. Who is this? Who is at my door? Who, who y'all inviting? Y'all, y'all expecting anybody? We going door integr- in, integrations. Like who? Where? Who did you say somebody come over? Who's over? We looking out the window. We weren't really ready for unexpected visitors. So we got to ask ourselves, who are you expecting? I love this thought. We're going to dive into it today. But as we are preparing for Christmas, we're getting ready for Christmas. Y'all know it's coming. I think we got a couple of weeks left, Um, which means it's time to wrap presents, right? Are are, are y'all... Are y'all a presence, a rapper type presence? Sister Daisy is shaking her head. No. Are you a person who wraps a gift or are you more of a gift bag kind of type person? The gift bag changed the, changed the game. You just throw some tissue in there and you good and make it cute. But are you more of a rapper type or is anybody is still, Sister Wilma still a rapping type? Sister Janice is still like out there in the chats. Are you a, do you actually gift wrap or do you do the gift bag? You know, you know, I, you know, I'm not trying to brag or anything, but you know, back in the day, I, I I had a job at Mervin's. Anybody remember Mervin's? Oh yeah, yeah. I worked at Mervin's, and my job at Mervin's, I was in the gift wrap department. Praise the Lord. So you know, not trying to brag, but you know, I, I could kind of do some gift wrapping. It's a it's a gift. Um, it's something that I operate in. But I had a gift as a gift wrapper. Now, uh, those who do like to wrap presents, some of y'all are tricky. Are you the tricky gift wrapper where you have a small gift? It's a beautiful gift. It might be like a ring, a watch. It'll be something small, but you choose to put it in a big box, and you do all the things, and you got people opening five boxes and tissue and all kind of – have you ever received a gift like that in the chat? Did you ever – did someone – are you that person who makes people go through all the things just to get a cute little gift? The gift is wonderful, but you made us go through so much to get there. There's different kind of different uh, gift wrapping ministries I'm, I'm hearing that uh, we can all operate in. But from this little illustration, we learn that a wonderful gift may be wrapped unexpectedly, right? A wonderful gift may not be wrapped as you expect it to be. And see, this was the problem with Jesus. When Jesus arrived on the scene, Jesus was this wonderful gift that wasn't wrapped like the people thought he should. He he was a wonderful gift that came in all types of, all these things, but he didn't look like the people expected him to. So in our passage, John, as we learned last week, was preparing the way. Getting the people's hearts ready for repentance. Remember we talked about repentance last week, how we are going to prepare the way of the Lord in our hearts. We're going to remove every um, hindrance. We're going to make the crooked path straight. We're, that's the things like there's responsibilities on our end in repentance. Like we bring these things to God and then we let God do a work. But we got a work we need to do too. So John was preaching to these people. And John, when he was preaching to him, that was some good preaching. You know you preaching good when people come to the altar and be like, now what do I do? I don't know what to do. What do I do? And now, what? you know, this is the same kind of preaching in, in Acts when the people are like, well, men and brethren, what should we do? That's some good preaching right there. Well, when he came to the people, they asked, what can I do? And he always told them that repentance looked like something. Repentance is you is lived out on the way you relate to people, how you treat people, how you, how you live in your everyday life. That's how you know you walk in in repentance. But John's preaching was so good that people begin to wonder: Is is this the Messiah? Is this the one? Because John out here preaching, he out here baptizing, he out here telling the folk what to do. This might be it, which kind of gives us a few hints on a couple of things that the people were expecting Messiah, but they really didn't know what to expect. They really didn't know what they were looking for. So any little hint of something, they were like, oh, this, is, this, is this him? This could be him. He preaching good. That might be him. Kind of reminds us of our lives. We got some stuff going on, and anytime you get a little hint of 
someone might be cute. Oh, could this be it? This might be, anytime you get a little something on the Indeed post, this could be the job that changes my life. We get little hints of something. Sometimes we don't even know what we're looking for or what to expect. This is why I could tell these people really didn't know what Messiah would look like because they were confusing him with John. John out here baptizing and being different and wearing different outfits. And they were like, well, this could be it. But this is what I love about John. John, we can learn so much about John's life. John knew who he was. John didn't need no one else to validate him. John knew his purpose. He wasn't trying to be like nobody else. He didn't have a, a, a savior complex. He wasn't trying to operate outside his gift. He stayed in his lane. John was like, oh, let me, let me correct you real quick. Let me tell you what he said. In verse 16, John said, indeed, I'm a, John said, answering to all, I indeed baptize you with water. Yeah, that's what I'm out here doing. I'm out here baptizing with water. But there's one mightier than I is coming. Someone say mightier than I. There's someone mightier than I coming. Whose sandal strap I'm not even worthy to uh, loose. I can't even tie a shoe. He's just that so I like I'm not even worthy to tie the lowest thing on his person. He says now when this person comes. He will baptize you. I'm baptizing you with water, but he's going to come and baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. That's what you're going to see a difference. And then, then he begins to describe the Messiah. And this is where we're going to spend the most of our time right here. In verse 17, look, he's going to give a description of the Messiah. He says, not me, but this is what the Messiah is going to look like. His winnowing fan in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor. And gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. All right, and we read this and we're like, okay, cool, 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 John, all right. And we just keep on reading. Like, how many really stopped on this verse, right? Like, we never even, like, we, we'll just keep reading, like, cool, all right, winnowing, whatever that is. Okay, we, let's just move on, and we'll just keep reading. But I want to park right here, because I've never really heard of a song or seen a picture of Jesus in this type of in, in imagery. I haven't seen a picture with Jesus with a winnowing fan, or even they have in other translations it says a winnowing fork in his hand. I ain't seen that on the stained glass windows. I, I ain't seen a, a gospel song yet about winnowing fan. Winnowing fan, winnowing fan. I ain't seen it. I ain't seen one. I ain't heard one. We, we, we ain't talking about the man with the fan. I, I haven't, but what, wait, can I just take a, can I digress really quick and I'll be back on this. Y'all remember church fans? Did y'all grow up with church fans? What was your favorite church fan? Did y'all have one? Why do we all have church fans? We didn't have air conditioning. What was wrong with our churches? We, we all needed church fans. My top favorite was, did you have the Mahala Jackson? Yeah, with the blue robe. Mm-hmm. Did you have the um, um, Jesus with the lamb across his neck? Mm-hmm. That's a fan favorite. Well, or the, mo my church mostly had funeral home fans. Anybody funeral home fans? That I don't know why they just they just ooh they just they catered to us, huh? They just brought death into our community and just just that's another. Okay, I digress. I'm back. All right, the man with the fan. We don't see this picture of Jesus too often, and this is why I want to camp right here. I want to talk about the image of Jesus, the man with the fan. What is this winnowing fan? What is this fork? And why don't we ever hear about it? Um, let's just, I, I want to just take it, let's just break it all the way down. What is a winnowing fan? I want to show just, there's a slide, not the video, but the slide of what, winnowing looks like in the ancient culture. Now, this is something to the people that they were talking to. This was like every day. This is like us going to the store and getting a loaf of bread. They understood this imagery. Like if I needed bread, they already knew in, the, in their mind, this is what I have to do to get bread. Winnowing, it was a hand device used by a farmer 
to throw a mix from his shredded pile of grain and straw into the air to let the wind carry the straw and the chaff away and the grain fall back for collection. Y'all get it? You see the pictures? In the final stage, the grain will be thrown up into the breeze by the shovel. A breeze carrying off the last of the chaff and leaving the grain ready for sifting and removing the pebbles by direct hand inspection. It was a very tedious job. If you wanted to get grain, you had to go through a process. You couldn't just pick some grain and just eat it off the stalk. You couldn't do it. It was a process. Somebody say process. And it is interesting to me that the Messiah's job is described as Jesus being the man with the winnowing fork, the winnowing fan. We have the, um, there's a fork up top. There's a man threshing the wheat. It had to go through a process, all right? And then there's one throwing it in the air and letting the chaff fall and the goodness of the grains to fall to the ground. I have a quick video. Brother Mike, I'm ready for that video. Just to break it down a little further. Because we, this, is, this is weird. We're not in an agricultural society. We like, what or what, how? I go and get Wonder Bread from, I hope y'all, y'all still doing Wonder Bread? We don't do white bread no more. Okay, we go, we go and get some Ezekiel bread. I don't know what we get no more. But go ahead, Brother Mike, if you can. This is the process. This is what it's looking like to be in a winnowing process. Oh, it's okay. I'm going to keep on keeping that is. That is. Can y'all see it online? There it is. We got the man. He has the winnowing fans in their hands. Come on, take some time and take this imagery in. Pouring out the grain and then using the fan to, to fan away all the things that are unnecessary. So interesting that this, Brother Mike, is the image of our Messiah. That he will take grain and pour it out. This grain has been through something. And after that grain has been poured out on the threshing floor, everything that's not needed is winnowed away, fanned away. All right, that's good. I think y'all got the. I think y'all got the gist. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about this process. This process of the Messiah, this image of the Messiah that we rarely hear about. The grain that we just saw is not edible at first. It has to go through a refining process. Somebody say refining. Come on, open up your mouth and say refining process because we know this is, all, this is a process. In Bible times, the grain was thrashed. It was trampled. It was crushed. It was beaten outside on the threshing floors to, to separate out the inedible parts of grain called chaff. Are y'all following me? The, the, it had to go through a process that it did not like. If you were to ask the grain, the grain would say, no, thank you. I don't want to go through this. But there's something that has to be done. The grain is good in itself, but it's something more in the grain that needs to be taken out. And it needs to go through a process to get everything that's inedible, ineditable out. The things that you cannot eat, you have to beat it, refine it, crush it to get to the good part. He, to get down to the good parts, it has to go through a process. Now, the wind was necessary. Did you see in the, in the context of this? The wind is necessary 
the wind, the fan, the winnowing fan, it was necessary. It's a part of the process. Now, I want you just to think about your life for a minute. I need you just to work with me and work through the, the corners of your mind. Have you been feeling a breeze in your life lately? Oh, my God. Are, do things feel unsettled? Think about your life. Are things just kind of topsy-turvy, up and down? Are things, uh, or do you feel like things are just up in the air? Do you just feel like things are just being tossed about to and fro? Do you feel a Will Smith anointing that your life got flipped, turned upside down? Is there just something going on and you're trying to get your footing and you're trying to figure out what's going on? Perhaps, my friend, that's not just difficulties. Perhaps it's the wind of God moving in your life. Perhaps it's the Ruach, the very breath of God moving in your life. You mistook it for difficulties. You mistook it for trials. You mistook it for people hating on you. You mistook it for all these other things. And perhaps it was the necessary wind of God that comes to blow everything that's not necessary out of your life after you've been crushed, after you've been broken. So we 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 wondering why we walking through like, man, my life is just not, I'm just broken. No, it's a process. This is the process that the Messiah takes us through and is necessary. Somebody say necessary. It's necessary to get down to the edible parts, the thing that's going to feed your soul, the thing that's going to feed others, the things that are going to feed the people around you. It has to go through a process. I have another question for you, and I'm almost done. We, we, we almost done. Has the heat in your life been turned up lately? You might have been feeling the fire. You might have been feeling the crushing. But sometimes you got to, if you feel a little heat, there's a little fire. You got how many people working on some deadlines? And you like, oh, my God, I don't know if I'm going to make it. How many people got some things that are due? Some situations you don't know how you're going to make it out of. The heat has been turned up. But perhaps it's Jesus coming with the Holy Ghost and fire. Now, I just want to stop right there because us Pentecostals, we hear Holy Ghost and fire, and it's on. We get to, yay, shouting and hallelujah, Holy Ghost and fire, he, hi, ya, yeah, yeah. We go to running. Holy Ghost and fire, are we ready to shout? We ready to get going because we know the Holy Ghost is coming and going to set us on fire. Woo, Jesus, I'm ready. But can I, can I add an addendum to that? Yes, I'm for all that. I want to run. I want to buck. I want to do this. I want to do all the things. But perhaps the Holy Ghost is not just here to make us shout. Perhaps the Holy Ghost is not the only function of the Holy Ghost is not just speaking in tongues. But perhaps... This fire of God that comes to burn up the chaff. Remember, the chaff are the things we don't need. <laughs> There's things that you don't need in your life. The things God separates out of your life that you just don't need, Sister Anu. You don't need it in your life. Perhaps the fire of God has come just to annihilate these things so that we will never go back to them again. The, the, it says it's an unquenchable fire. So if it's an unquenchable fire, once God destroys the things that you really don't need in your life, you can't go back to it if it's burned up, if it's destroyed, if it's annihilated. This is what the fire of God does in our lives. It destroys. It breaks the yoke. It destroys the yoke. And it lifts the heavy burden so that you will never have to return to it again. Those unnecessary parts of your life, those things that are not bearing fruit, the things that are inedible. I don't know why I can't say that today. The things you can't eat, the things that people want to, you know, you can't, they, they can't tolerate to be around you because we have some of these things in our life. These are the things that God wants to burn up. 
And I know we see these verses and then people automatically go to hell. Like, that's right, you're going to hell. And it's going to be an unquenchable fire. He's throwing you, the tree is at the root and we're throwing it in the fire. Yeah, okay. You know, I mean, we all got different translations and versions. But I just feel in this context that Jesus is coming to burn up everything that's not like God. Burning up the Holy Ghost with fire. Somebody say fire. See, the people in Jesus' day, a good number of them, a lot of them, missed the first advent of Jesus. The first advent of Jesus, when Jesus appeared on the earth, they wanted a Savior without a relationship. They were just ready for, the, for, for God just to save them out of their situation. And now this is why I love Advent, because it puts us in their shoes. 400 years of waiting. There was radio silence from the Old Testament to the New Testament. After the book of Malachi, there was radio silence for 400 years. God didn't say a word. Y'all go back and read what I said, and I'm done until... The time has come for me to fulfill my promises. It wasn't until John the Baptist parted his lips that the Lord speak again to this community, to this generation. Yes, he sent angels to Mary and to Elizabeth and the Zacchaeus, but God spoke to John in the wilderness. Y'all remember last, last week? This is, the, this is what these people, let's put ourselves in their shoes. They were waiting for Messiah. They were under the oppressions of the Romans. They didn't have their own land. Everything was taxed. Everything they were, you know, they were always going through. Everywhere they went, they were being berated as Jews. Kind of feels familiar to black folks in current situations, but we can really relate to how they felt under Roman occupation. They were longing for a Savior, looking at the scriptures. When will our Messiah come? What will he look like? Every woman wanted to birth the Messiah. Let this, please let me be the one to birth the Messiah. But they were waiting for a Messiah, but they just really just wanted to be saved. Like, God, just save us. We don't really need to do the relationship thing. I mean, just, just get us out of our, our situation, and we'll be fine. You know, a lot of us love Jesus, the concept of Jesus being the Savior, but not necessarily the Lord of our lives. Jesus, just save me from hell. Just give me my insurance papers out of hell, and then I'll just go on and live my life, and we'll meet up somewhere when I need something. See you when I see you. This is the, this is the complex that they had. They wanted a Savior, but no relationship. But Jesus came as Messiah but most people missed it because, watch this, Jesus wanted to do a work in their hearts. Jesus wanted to establish the kingdom in their hearts. Yes, he was fully Messiah, but he didn't come as they expected. He didn't come in the wrapping paper that they thought. They thought Jesus was coming on a white horse, going to knock out the Romans, going to do all the things, which is prophesied in Scripture, and which Jesus is like, oh, yeah, don't get it twisted. I really am doing this. But guess what? I'm coming, I'm coming in a different way. Mm. I'm coming different. Remember in our worship time with Minister Lauren, just expect the unexpected from Jesus sometimes? He said, I'm, I'm coming different. I'm coming to do a work inside. The kingdom of heaven is inside. Remember, every parable was like, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a pearl. The kingdom of heaven. The king, he was always doing all these things to show you that I'm first establishing kingdoms in people's hearts through a refining process. See, most people don't want that part of Messiah. They want the saving part. Just save us. Get us out of jail free so we can just go and do our own things. It's like children of Israel. Just get us out of Egypt and then leave us alone. That's, that, that's, not the, that's not the relationship God wants from you. So this image of Jesus as the winnowing, the guy with the, hand, with the fan in his hand, winnowing Jesus, wants to take you through a process. Not to hurt you. Not to disappoint you. Not to 
to, you know, break you down, but it's to get something out of you. have something valuable inside of you that needs to be worked out through a process. Will you trust Jesus in this process, the winnowing process, the one who, um, uh, and look how meticulous Jesus is. He, he has the winnowing fan in his hand. He's throwing, he's separating the chaff out of our hearts and our minds. And he, he thoroughly cleans out his threshing floor. That, that work was so meticulous that you had to go through and get rocks and pebbles out by hand. It wasn't just like, you know, they have machines now. But back then, it was a meticulous work. Can you imagine Jesus sitting over your life, being so meticulous, taking out everything that's not like him? Not to break you down, but because he loves you. But because he loves you. So we're, we're closing. And in this Advent season, I just have a, a question for you. Who are you expecting? Who are you expecting? We all have situations in our lives where we are waiting on Jesus. Amen? Are you waiting on Jesus? We are always, Sister Anu opened up the other week so beautifully of how we are waiting. We're all waiting. And we go through this. Uh, this is universal. Waiting is universal. We're always, kids are waiting to get older, can't wait to drive, then I can't wait till I'm 21, then I can't wait till I have a family, I can't wait, like, we're always waiting for something, I can't wait to finish school, I can't wait to get my business started, I can't wait to start my career, we're always saying, I can't wait, I can't wait, I can't wait, but how you wait matters, do y'all know that? Joyce Meyer says, patience is not the ability to wait, it's how we behave while we're waiting. During this Advent season, who are you expecting? What, what Jesus are you, are you waiting to show up in your life? Don't be like the people who miss Jesus because they were so fixated that Jesus was just going to come in one way. The Messiah was going to look like this, and this is how it's going to be. And if he doesn't come like this, then that's not him. They missed him. So the, the admonishment today is for us to think about how are you, who are you waiting for? Are you open for Jesus to surprise you? Are you open for Jesus to arrive in your life, maybe unexpectedly? See, we want God to do things for us, but God gives us what we really need. God, I can't wait. to. Can you give me a... Give me a new job. Well, okay. But can I work on your attitude while you're at this job? God, can you, can you, you know, I, I just need money. Can you, if I just had money, this will solve all my problems. Well, yeah, but can we work on your budgeting skills? Can we, can we, can we work on maybe your, the, your wanting, your greed, you wanting to stunt on everybody when you really don't have it? See, a lot of things we want. We want the Messiah to come and rescue us, but Jesus wants to do another thing in our hearts. Will you yield to the winnowing fan of Jesus? Will you yield to this aspect of Jesus as Messiah? We, you know, Christmas, we're going to hear all the curls, lowly baby, in a manger, peace on earth. We're going to do all the adjectives. It's going to be great. We, and Jesus is all that. But don't leave out this winnowing fan, no. Come on, let the Holy Ghost blow in your life and let the fire take out everything that's not like God and let it refine the things that are supposed to stay. All right, our sailor questions for this week for you just to think about, number one, are you willing to increase your expectation to receive Jesus in whatever capacity he chooses to arrive in your life? 
as we are in Advent season, as we are waiting, anticipating, expecting the first, we celebrate the first arrival of Jesus. Will you let Jesus do this work in your life? Increase your expectation. Who are you waiting for? God, I'm waiting for you to come however you want to come. Come on, a lot of us need to open up our, our expectations, open up our capacity, open up our holy imagination and say, God, you can do it however you want to do it. God, I surrender it all to you. I give you my heart, my mind. I give you my expectations. God surprised me. It was the last time you asked God to do that. God, you just do whatever you just surprise me. You have a friend like that. You're like, what should I order? What should I get? And they're like, I don't care. Just whatever. That, those friends drive me crazy, by the way. Do you want a Coke, a Sprite? I don't know, whatever. What, no, I need to know what do you want. But this is how our attitude should be towards Jesus. Jesus, do however you want. Whatever you do is going to be good. It's, whatever you do is going to be full of love. So I'm open. Somebody say, I'm open. God, I'm open. God, I'm open. Number two. Can you sit with this winnowing image of Jesus this week? Can you imagine Jesus standing over your life and loving you in this way? Loving you so much that he won't leave you as is. He won't, he won't just let you. He got, Jesus always wants the fullest potential out of us. He won't just leave us in a state that we can't be used. You can't eat grain when, you first, when it first comes off the stock. You can't be used. Yet we say, God, use me, God, use me, God, use me. Okay, are you ready to be used? Well, let's go through the process. So when we're in the process, we won't be mad about it. We won't complain. We won't put on a long face because we know it's a hand of love. It's Jesus doing this. He doesn't have a frown on his face. He's not mad or irritated, taking out the rocks and pebbles. He's not doing it all mad. He's doing it with love. This is, you're going to be so great after this. You're going to be so, oh, I'm going to be able to use you in so many ways after this process. So many people are going to be able to eat off your life and feed from the, your wisdom when I get through with you in this process. And number three, ask yourself, how do I feel the winnowing fan of Jesus already at work in my life? Am I letting him separate the bad from the good in my heart? I'm going to sit with that. And let's remember, it's Jesus' job. <laughs> to control the winnowing fan. It's not our job. It's not, it's, that's not our job to separate the good from bad in people's hearts. That's not our job. It's not our job to tell people that, you know, the quenchable fire is for them. That's not our, that's not our job. <laughs> our job is to love people, love God, <laughs> and submit our own selves to this process. This is Jesus' job. Jesus is the Messiah with the wind and wind fan in his hand. I love that. Lauren, I need a song. I need a wind and wind hand fan song. I don't know. I worship Jesus, the God of the winnowing fan, the God of the winnowing fort, the one who throws it in the air and the wind of God comes and takes out. Eee! I can shout hallelujah. So, God, we give you glory. Thank you for your word. Thank you for who you are. We just take time to worship you. You're so multifaceted, Jesus. There's so many things that you try to relate to, try to give us analogy so that we could just relate to you in our human minds. But God, we worship you today as the God the Messiah, the Savior of the world, who has the winnowing fan in his hands, who takes out everything that's not like him to be used for your glory. God, we welcome the wind of the Holy Spirit. We welcome your breath, oh God. 
We welcome it. We welcome your Holy Spirit to come with fire. God, we open up. We open up our hearts, our minds, our souls, and we say, oh, God, with all our heart, if there are any things, there's anything that's not like you, oh, God, will you send it through your refining process? Now, this is a prayer that only mature saints can pray. Baby saints will have a hard time with this. But if you trust and believe in the God of love and the goodness and mercy, the God who loves you, will you submit yourself to this process? God's not out to hurt you. God's not out to kill you. God's not out to make your life difficult. God just wants to draw out purpose of you in your life. So God, we submit. We surrender. We give it to you. We make room. We, we prepare our hearts. We prepare the way of the Lord in our hearts so that you could come in and do whatever you want. You have run of the place, God. Rearrange it how you want. Throw out all, all the things you want to. We welcome you to do a renovation, a remodeling. God, you come in like at a hoarder show and take out everything that don't belong there. God, we, we give you the right of way, oh God. We give you the right of way, Jesus. We want to be people with prepared hearts. We want to anticipate your arrival. We welcome you, Messiah. Surprise us. Do whatever you want to do. We, we open up our mind. If you want to come through a window, a door, you want to take off the roof of a ceiling, however you want to get to us, God, we are open. And Lord, you love to use people. So even the people that you send to our hearts and to our minds and to our lives, we welcome them. I feel the Holy Spirit saying, drop your pride. If people approach you this week, they want to help or they see a need, drop your pride and let God use people to bless your life. Will you let God use people who you never even expected, someone you might not even like, someone you might not even get along with, someone you, who's been difficult? God will send these people into your life and will you just receive them as Jesus coming into your life in unexpected, unexpected ways. God, we, we just want to um, lean into this imagery. God, we pray that you will bless our time, bless our week. If there's anyone who is watching and you do not even know this Jesus, we invite you into a relationship with the God who loves you so much. And all you have to do is open up your heart and say, Lord, I receive you. I want to know this kind of God. So will you just receive Jesus into your life and watch God do a, a new work in you? God, we seal this time and we say, have your way in us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, saints, family, friends, do not forget next week. We will be right here in the building. Pastor Mike will be here. He will be preaching a mighty word. I plan to be running around the building, so you can join me in that. Um, yes, we are come. Everyone is welcome to come. We do not have a registration process um, per se, but we do ask everyone to uh, come to show your proof of vaccination and and or a negative COVID test 48 hours prior. Uh, don't forget if you are an angel tree participant, if you took names, we will be wrapping those presents after service next week. So come, make sure you bring your po the toys and presents that we're giving to the kids. I can't wait to see you next week. And if you're on the way, uh, every way we, everywhere, we can't wait to see you again on this virtual platform. Y'all be blessed. Have a good week, and don't forget to show people the way.